This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tong. In this month's featured article, we're talking cardioneuroablation, and I'm really pleased to present the midterm results and the safety, efficacy, patient preference with Roman Piotrowski, electrophysiologist and senior corresponding author from Warsaw, Poland. Roman, welcome. Welcome, and thank you for invitation. Well, congratulations. As you know, so much of cardioneural ablation has started from Brazil, then Beijing, China, then Turkey, and you've really put Poland on the map with some of your randomized work, and then now this very large, impressive series looking at the acute procedural efficacy in a very large number of patients. Tell us a little bit about how your center became so interested in cardinal ablation. So uh, thank you for uh, this question. So uh, I will present our story because uh, uh, I would like to describe the beginnings and I have to back a few years because uh, we start uh, cardinal ablation in 2016. And uh, this year we performed just one cardinal ablation. One year later in 2017, uh, we performed two more. So as you can see, that was uh, not an impressive number of cardinal ablation because during the first uh, two years, uh, we performed just three cases. But uh, it was uh, and but at, it was beginning. So as you know, the beginning are also difficult. But because our results were promising, so uh, our initial experiences uh, were presented in uh, our national meetings. And uh, after that, uh, the number of uh, referrals uh, to our center rapidly increased. And from year to year, uh, we performed more and more procedures. And ultimately, in the last year, uh, 2023, we performed 111 cardioneurobrations procedures. So which means, uh, we perform two, sometimes three procedures per week. So uh, the important question uh, should be raised is uh, where do we get patients from? So I think uh, the patients are referred to our center uh, from uh, all over the country. And uh, we should uh, keep in our mind that uh, in Poland live over 38 million people. So, and the number of potential candidates for cardiovascular ablation is also large. So uh, a large number of referrals is the results of showing uh, our results of cardiovascular ablation in Poland, giving uh, educational lectures on cardiovascular ablation during cardiology meetings or organizing uh, cardiovascular ablation workshops. So uh, it's important, in my opinion, because uh, during such meetings, uh, other doctors exchange contact details uh, to facilitate the referral of appropriate patient to our center. So that's uh, the one of the ways we get patients to the cardiovascular ablation. Uh, another important source uh, of our patient is uh, performing tilt testing because in our center at Grochowski Hospital, uh, tilt testing uh, are performed for many, many years. So uh, we can um, qualify the appropriate patient uh, for the cardiac ablation. But um, uh, in my opinion, the most important, uh, the most important uh, in receiving referrals. Uh, to our center, the patients, is the awareness of the doctors uh, who are increasingly considering cardiac ablation as an alternative uh, to pacemaker implantation and uh, refer patients for electrophysiological consultation, not for uh, pacemaker implantation. Wonderful. So amazing to get that sort of academic and innovative reputation and getting referrals throughout the whole country. I know you have a really nice summary slide for us to take us a little bit through about this report. Can you take us through that? So uh, our study included uh, 115 consecutive uh, patients uh, treated between uh, 2016 and 2022, who completed uh, at least one year follow-up. Uh, and now I would like to show uh, and uh, present our results because there was no significant procedure-related acute complication. Uh, median follow-up lasted uh, 26 months, 83% uh, of patients remained free from syncope, and uh, of 17% uh, of patients uh, with syncope recurrence, uh, we noted that the syncope burden significantly decreased. In 9 of, uh, uh, out of 10 patients, pacing system removal was possible, 
repeated carbogenic ablation was needed uh, in three percent of patients, uh, whereas pacemaker implantation was needed uh, in five, four uh, percent uh, of patients. And the most frequent midterm complication of carbogenic ablation was sinus uh, rhythm acceleration, which was symp symptomatic in twenty. 7% of the patient. And uh, from this group, 7% uh, of patients requi required chronic beta blockers or ivabradine. Uh, sinus node modification, uh, modification was necessary in no one. And other complications uh, included dyspnea, chronic chest pain, and decreased uh, exercise capacity uh, were might and uh, were reported by 14% uh, of the patient. And uh, the next uh, important issue is patient acceptance of cardiogenic ablation, because the patient acceptance of cardiogenic ablation was very high, because 96% uh, uh, of patients stated that, uh, that it was worth to undergo the procedure. So I think it's a uh, very important um, results because patient accepted the procedure and procedure is uh, safety, is safe and uh, is related with uh, high efficacy. So uh, going to the conclusion, the main findings from this study is the acute safety of cardiogenic ablation is excellent. Uh, Midterm safety of cardiogenic ablation is acceptable. And there is uh, only 7% rate of chronic symptomatic uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia it's, and is the main complication. And clinical efficacy of cardiogenic ablation during median uh, follow-up uh, lasted uh, 26 months, exceed 80%, and patients' acceptance of the pro procedure is high. Well, this is a fantastic experience coming from your center in Warsaw. It's a very large number of patients. And even though you say it's midterm, you know, it's over two years, which I think is, is excellent. You know, as, as we know, there are many questions about when re may or may not happen in recurrences. Do you have any new insights in some of the patients that don't receive the benefit that we're intending to? Uh, so renovation is an uh, important topic, I think. And um, uh, now there is, uh, we don't have tools, uh, which can uh, predict it, uh, that drain inversion may occur. Uh, so this is uh, the main limitation of this procedure, I think. But uh, based on uh, liter literature and our uh, previous uh, randomized study, the rain elevation and the redo cardiogenic ablation uh, was uh, need in almost 8 uh, to 10 percent of the patients. And then one other question that many Heart Rhythm Journal readers and viewers will want to know is just your general approach that you stated in the manuscript that the approach hasn't changed too much. You start with the paraceptal ganglia on the right anterior GP, then work on the right side. And only if you don't achieve the endpoints, then do you do the left superior GP. Can you take us through the rationale as to why you always start the paraceptal before going to the left side? Uh, okay, so uh, we started uh, performing cardiogenic ablation uh, using just uh, anatomical approach. And uh, during this time, uh, our approach uh, still evolving. And now uh, for uh, confirming total vagal denervation, we use extracardiac vagal stimulation. And uh, our approach includes uh, biatral ablation. And usually we start from the left side and then we are going to the right side. Uh, now, uh, it depends on the indication because if the uh, patient uh, has only a sinus bradycardia, we can uh, ablate just superior uh, ganglia. But if the patient has both atrioventricular block on sinus arrest, we can uh, ablate both. Uh, and uh, in case uh, when uh, the atrioventricular block is the main problem, we can concentrate and focus on uh, ablate inferior ganglia. Sometimes it's uh, impossible to avoid uh, uh, ablate uh, superior ganglia and, and uh, we uh, ablate all, all of ganglias uh, to confirm vagal denervation. And the extra cardiac stimulation, are you using Dr. Pachon's stimulator or are you using yeah. a different one? 
Yeah, it was a kindly gift from uh, Professor Pachon, so we use that. And another important tool, I think, is intracardiac echocardiography because uh, we use still uh, anatomical approach, uh, but intracardiac uh, echocardiography allows us to uh, localize uh, presumed uh, GP sites, especially uh, in this Interior, in, inferior posterior uh, ganglia. So I think uh, in this case, ice is really helpful. And my final question, which is for me, is that this is a series of reflex asystole greater than three second pauses associated with syncope. What do you do for the patient that presents to you with predominant vasodepressor syncope without bradycardia? without bradycardia, so uh, we do not cardioneuroablation. Uh, now we are uh, more restrictive and uh, the patient with pure vasodepressor uh, response uh, is, uh, are not uh, qualified to cardioneuroablation. If uh, the patient has mixed response, okay, we can consider, but if the patient has cardio, uh, pure cardioinhibitory response, I think that is the best uh, candidate for cardioneuroablation. That is beautiful. Well, Dr. Piotrowski, I've been following your work and I want to congratulate you on this featured article. You have the only randomized control trial that was previously published as well. So you're really putting Varshawa on the map and I want to congratulate you, your co-authors and your center. Thank you. Thank you for being on Heart Rhythm TV. Thank you. Thank you.